This is P and W Haunts and Homicides. Hi, Cassie. Hi, Caitlin. Ooh, so profesh <laughs> on the first take. We did it. We did it. <laughs> Another week. Mm-hmm. Another yeah murder. I was <laughs> uh, a few. I was gonna say Uh-oh. I. I started to say another week, and then I was like, "Oh, um, do I mean another day, another dollar?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, well, anyway." I like another we- week, another yeah. murder. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I feel like we don't have enough rosé for this, but <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> there is literally never enough. No. Okay. I've got like my very news angry voice on. Yeah, today. you do. You're making me sound bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. Um, so we actually have some very exciting news. Yeah. We are going to be guesting on another pod, ooh, ooh. TBD. <laughs> we will hopefully, by the time this episode airs, be able to let you know specifically where you can find it, link in the show notes, mm-hmm. and get you super excited to hang out with a couple of uh, our other podly friends. Yes. yes. They're great. You guys are going to love, love it. them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're obsessed. <laughs> yeah. And we just uh, recorded... Yeah, we recorded our story today. Yeah, and it was really good. Yeah. Chris and Cassie both agree it was fantastic. (laughs) It was so so good. Just over here trying not to break my arm, (laughs) patting myself on the back. Yep. She did all the work. I had nothing to do with it. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) She's going to insist on saying that. (laughs) (laughs) She told me not to, but... You did. I ha- I yeah. can't take credit for it. You did well, it. Well, you're going to do all of the editing, which I feel like that's the heavy lifting. Yeah, me. I may have gotten a little like tongue tied and <laughs> probably several other things as well. Should we release an episode that we just don't edit? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, are we that brave? I don't know. I don't think anyone would stay. You guys can stay. weigh in. But <laughs> like, oh, we're turning this off now. <laughs> well, what I love about actually one of the other pods that's like my favorite in the world is uh, Wine and Crime. And they talk about all the time, why do people pay us for this? Because <laughs> they really, um, and they do pretty limited editing. And they, um, if you're a Patreon, like myself, <laughs> um, you get to watch videos of them recording the episodes and they're hilarious and they come as they are and (laughs) i think it's fantastic um yeah yeah we're working up to being that brave we're working on it you guys (laughs) in front of our adoring fans in the public (laughs) we'll get there it takes practice yeah so we love them as well. Um, Unfortunately, that's not the podcast we'll be guesting on. <laughs> yeah, I was yet. just going to say. Caitlin will reach out to them and they will, will be like, um, yeah, you guys are like so popular and great. You can come <laughs> on our show. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I would fangirl so hard. Oh my God. You would have to be spearheading whatever we're talking about that day because I would just be over there losing my shit on mic. Oh, man. That would be great. <sighs> someday <laughs> all right should i all get right, to down to the tarot business i shuffled them a bunch before so yeah oops. i saw that you shuffled those oh, cards pretty intensely okay. are you sending me your vibes your i'm trying vibes. really hard not to send you my vibes i'm trying <laughs> to send my var- vibes barbs my verbs trying to send you my vibes about this case just to the cards. Just to the cards. Yeah, I don't want them. Yeah, you don't. You really don't. Okay. As promised, there's literally nothing about this case that is happy, but you will make a lot of faces, so... She's cutting the cards. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I feel like my... (laughs) It's... That's an indication, I feel like. All right. The cards are just kind of gravitating towards... (laughs) Towards the right answer, if you will. Okay. And as per usual, we've got our books out and at the ready. I'm going to find this one in our new baby book. It's not a book about babies. It just happens to be a really small book. (laughs) (laughs) For your baby hands. For my baby hands. That's right. Okay, so here we've drawn the Four of Wands. So the card is like two. Is this a boy and a girl? 
Looks like it, yeah. Like a boy and a girl standing. There's like a cityscape behind them. They're holding flowers. Uh, the girl's got like a basket. It's a, it's a very hippie <clears throat> vibe. I it feel is. Like. It is. Yeah. Okay, the Four of Wands. The little baby book says the garden is growing luxuriously and these two have wandered away from their stress and planning to have a little fun. It might be a surprise, but you've got some good times on the horizon. I don't know if this goes with your case. Um, <laughs> Take a break. Yes from- <laughs> <laughs> Take a break from your hard work and put all your energy into treating yourself. Oh, no. Know okay. About this. Okay. So on the surface, <laughs> this doesn't seem like it matches, but oh, yeah. Let me see the book. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're like, oh, car. <laughs> mm, okay. Yeah. We'll we'll go ahead and we'll bookmark that. Okay. For, uh, after we've gone through the case, and I'll let you know why this seemingly happy-go-lucky card actually seems to kind of fit this. Um. <laughs> Honestly, truly horrific case. Okay, okay. so here's our big book. And this is a definitely, it's a different image. So the description of it is kind of interesting, but I'm going to hand it over to Cassie. She's going to make me read it. Good Lord. (laughs) (laughs) From the four great staves planted in the foreground, there is a great garland suspended. Two female figures uplift nosegays, which we looked it up, and they're a small <laughs> bouquet of flowers that smell really, really good. Yeah. So it makes your nose gay. Gay with all of the sweet scents. Yeah. I love it. At their side is a bridge over a moat leading to an old manorial house. The divinatory meanings. There are... Oh, that was like the description of the yeah, card. Yeah, it's just literally I always the do description that. of the card. Goodness. Okay. <laughs> they are for once, almost on the surface, country life, haven of refuge, a species of domestic harvest home, repose, concord, harmony, po- prosperity, peace, and the perfected work of these. Oh, that's so creepy. Oh, it's actually, oh, it do, it doesn't make any sense, but it makes so much sense, and I, I don't like it. Oh, no. She's, like, throwing the book. Yeah. <laughs> no more. Against, against the wall. Great. Okay. I can't wait to figure this out. Oh, my God. Okay, when I explain to you why I think that makes sense, you're just going to be like, ew, ew, ew. Okay. 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 All right, here we go. In preparation for this case, I listened to podcast episodes. I read a ton of articles, but I also listened to, um, I think it's something like 11 hours of an audio book. <gasps> mm-hmm. 11 uh, hours. It's a lot of hours of about murder. the victims and the perpetrator. Aww. Yeah. So it's a, I know so much about this case that I um, I told Cassie at the start of this that um, I started working on this case and it took me actually a couple of weeks to get through everything that I wanted to cover. I decided not to make this a two-parter um, because it's it's pretty rough. So I feel like, you know, you can decide if you want to get into it or not. Um, I highly recommend that you do because it's super interesting. I'm but, not gonna. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you are. <laughs> uh, not fully. Not not 11 hours worth. No, of. no, no, no. No. Um, so I listened to actually a really fascinating book that really dug deep on this case. So just kind of a quick shout out about that book um, in case you guys do want to do um, kind of more in-depth research or want some good listening material. The book is called I, The Creation of a Serial Killer by Jack Olson. So just in case anyone wants to check it out, um, I'm including as much of the information that I've found through the course of my research that I can possibly pack into an episode of somewhat reasonable length. We'll see how <laughs> how well we deliver on that. Um just to kind of give you guys the whole story so you don't have to spend the countless hours that I did, but um, you can kind of get the the r- the real meat of the case. Um, so I hope even though this one is kind of, it's really, it's a really brutal case, you guys, but I hope that you like the deep dive into this case. Um, there's definitely a lot here to unpack. Um I do want to preface it. I don't usually because we're true crime and paranormal. So I feel like you know what you came for. But um, trigger warning for pretty much everything in this case. 
Um, if you are sensitive about any aspect of crime or violence against women, children, or animals. No! Just proceed with caution and know that we love all of you creeps. You're about to have a horrific, but definitely a creepy-ass day. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Uh, So today we're going to be talking about Keith Hunter Jesperson, Hmm. a.k.a. the happy face killer. Ew. Yeah. No. (laughs) No, there's nothing happy about it. I'm already tapped out. Yeah. So what I found actually through a couple of different social media outlets and different like blog posts and things is that people get the happy face killer confused with the smiley face murders. Oh, yeah. Easy, easy to um, get confused on that. But um, by the end of this, you will have no confusion about uh, which is which for sure. The smiley face, it just bears no resemblance. They're not, okay. they're not the same. Um, so Keith Hunter Jesperson was born April 6th, 1955 in Chilliwack, British Columbia in Canada. Ooh. I know Chilliwack. <laughs> <laughs> Um, interesting start. Um, (laughs) So I'm going to give you a lot of backstory on Keith. I do feel like it's important to remember that while we might feel awful about his upbringing or traumatic events in his life, just bear in mind, we will still get to hate him and call him a dick by the end because of the horrible things that he perpetrated on other people. Yep, no excuse. Yeah, no, definitely not. Yeah. Um, When we do the background on people like Keith, it's not to excuse the things that they've done, but it does help us to kind of illuminate aspects of, you know, what what maybe is a a piece of the puzzle with someone like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So honestly, like I said, the amount of research that I did for this case, we're really only going to be able to scratch the surface in Keith's case in regards to to the trauma in his past. Um, But I do feel like it's critical that we examine some of the things that eventually sent this really the whole story just down a very dark and horrific winding path. So that's our favorite. right? Yeah. So so here we go. Um, he grew up in a household with five siblings that was undoubtedly marred by violence. Mm. His alcoholic bully of a father seemingly saved the worst of the beatings that he doled out to the kids for Keith. Uh, was he like the oldest or the he youngest? He wasn't. No. I th- he's kind of a middle child. Yeah. Um, even taking the brunt of the abuse by their father, it seems Keith received very little sympathy from his brothers, who teased him about his learning disabilities. Oh. Yeah, amongst other things. Mm. Keith spent most of his time alone and developed a very vivid imagination, as well as a love of animals. Oh. Yeah. D- did he love animals? He did at one point, okay. yes. Okay. His best and likely only friend for most of his childhood um, was the family dog, Duke. Oh, Duke. 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 So cute. I know. In his early life, we know at first that he was able to create meaningful relationships, at least with animals. Because it definitely seems like he was very alienated in all of his relationships with any humans. Um, he loved animals so much that he even rescued a crow that he named Blackie. Oh my God. I love that. (laughs) I love crows. I don't understand why people hate them so much. (laughs) Well, they're really smart, but also very creepy. Yeah. Um, I just want a bunch to send like letters for me. That's all I want in my life. I feel like it's a little bit of a, like, it's a witchy type thing to be, to like the crows. It's sort of a twist on the Harry Potter, the owls. Yeah. (laughs) So he had tried to nurse this crow back to health because it had some sort of an injury. Oh. Yeah. Um, One of his brothers laughed at him and proceeded to kill it brutally with a friend using a jackknife. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm going to give you a second. Why? What a 
dick. Why does anyone, why do kids do any of the things that they do that are super dickish? That guy sounds like he was going to grow up to be the serial killer. <laughs> I know, ironically. God, poor Blackie. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, jackknife, just really quickly, because I did look into this. I'm like, what the hell is a jackknife? Um, it's been, I, <laughs> I was like, either. jackknife, I was which like, is, sure. yeah, which is apparently <laughs> Canadian for pocket knife, I'm guessing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I looked it up, though, because I thought, like, maybe this is some type of knife I've never heard of. But nope. Um, so obviously that's a pretty brutal way to kill any animal. It's messed up, dude. Yeah. Mm. But like, sure, because why not horrifically taunt your brother by killing an innocent animal that he obviously cares deeply for, right? <sighs> yeah? Okay. That's- so, well, much of this episode will focus on why maybe you shouldn't torture your siblings, Other than, duh, basic common decency. (laughs) And the fact that that's animal cruelty. You're supposed to fart on your brother. Yeah, I I mean, like, tickle them or, like, hide their stuff. (laughs) Like, other harmless pranks. Like, this is, it's like, here's the line way back here. Here's you about three miles past it. Yuck. So, um, Keith retaliated by returning to his brother's room and destroying his model planes. Okay. Okay, so I mean, seems fair to me, honestly. That seems pretty tame compared to killing, right? Yeah. (laughs) So here's where we start to get a taste of like what Keith's childhood was probably really like, because Keith's father then beat him because I'm not sure there was really already enough trauma there. Wait, yeah, he got beat. Yes. For his brother killing his crow. And no, then he got beat for beating yeah. or for destroying the brother's Did model his planes. brother get beat? Doesn't sound like it. Oh. Yeah. I mean, obviously a lot of this information is gathered, you know, how many years later yeah. about his childhood. But yeah, nope. Getting the distinct uh, impression that that is not the case. Shortly after his father enlisted him to help in cruelly killing unwanted animals on their family farm... Such as feral cats. Hmm. Yeah, I don't love this. Kitty. Yeah, they shot them with BB guns and would throw them into burlap saps. Saps. <laughs> burlap saps. Burlap saps. <laughs> <laughs> they shot them with BB guns and would throw them into burlap sacks and drown them. That's so fuck. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of that happening on a lot of you know <sighs> farms and things like you know. I, I hate it. Like, hate shooting it. them with BB guns is one thing. Like, to scare them off. I mean, I obviously I'm don't still not agree condoning. with it. Not okay. <laughs> yeah. But then to throw them in a burlap sack and drown them, like, that's just... It's awful. That's a little... It's that's really extra. awful. They didn't need to do that. Yeah. So, but the good news is that eventually his violent escapades won over a group of boys that would prove to be even more sadistic in their methods of torturing and killing animals for fun. Oh, great. Yeah. So here we go. Party. Yeah. It's super gross. Um, there's a lot of backstory on that. We're going to go ahead and skip forward to when the family moved to Sela, Washington. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> for his dad's job opportunity when Keith was about 12. So he seemed to be able to keep pace in the American school system since apparently the Canadian school system has much higher standards. I, who would have thought? Weird. Right? Yeah, weird. <laughs> Is anyone surprised by this? <laughs> LOL. <laughs> Um, He did, however, continue to struggle in social settings, finding it hard to make new friends because of his Canadian accent. Aww. I don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) I love Canadian accents. I do, too. What's wrong with people? Kids are dicks. They are. Yeah. They're dicks, eh? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Please leave that in. Maybe. We'll see. I'm sorry to all the Canadians listening. I am not sorry. We find your accent so adorable. Aww. Please listen to us and share us with all of your friends. Okay, back to Keith, guys. Let's stay focused. Yes. Yet again, he found himself being teased by his peers while also being tormented by his father at home. His father even started charging him room and board as a preteen. Oh, my God. So... I didn't necessarily include this in my notes, but I know from all of the research, he assumed, Keith assumed that all of his siblings were being charged, you know, room and board. Yeah, like him. His dad was literally just charging him. What was his 
thing against this kid. Like, <laughs> his dad was a God. serious, world class, abusive dickhead. And it's so upsetting to hear in um, pieces of, um, you know, one of the books that I listened to, his dad really defend his actions towards Keith and say, oh, I never did that. or, And I'm like, I just don't feel like a kid makes that type of stuff up. No. Yeah. Oh, so, man. There's a lot to unpack, you guys. I just, I never understand why, like, an abuser will, like, single out one person It's easy. You can get other people to join the bandwagon because they're just happy it's not happening to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really sad, but I think that's what it comes down to. So um, roughly around this time when they were living in Sela, one of his classmates was quoted as saying of Keith, he could be bright when he wanted to, but then he would do something stupid. He'd be too kind or too mean, too generous or too stingy. He never saw the in-between. I always wondered if he was in control of his own brain, if he might have had brain damage. He sure acted like it. Oh. So, I mean, that was what one of his classmates was saying, um, that they basically were thinking of him at around age 14. Yeah. So, I mean, already you're seeing some signs that, like, this kid hasn't developed normally or maybe grown up in a normal environment. You're already starting to see some of that. Yeah. So that could be anything. I mean, he could have been hit in the head by his dad, or it could just be like a mental illness or just like the fact that he's been raised shitty. Like, yeah, honestly, anything. Nothing other than just, you know, kind of a debatably, I mean, really not debatable. It was definitely an abusive background if you act, if you ask me, but um, nothing has ever been substantiated in terms of like a diagnosable mental health issue or illness or in terms yeah. of like a brain injury. So, but, they but didn't I really just do that back then anyway. Right? Yeah. He's been in prison for quite some time. Yeah. So it, it's never been substantiated. I just did think that was kind of an interesting excerpt yeah. from, it you know, a classmate that knew him when he was relatively young. So um, still at this time, Keith exhibited a great deal of care for the family dog, Duke. Um, Duke was really his first and only friend. Super sad. sad. (laughs) Uh, Duke slept with him every night and hardly let Keith out of his sight. Um, Keith would actually lift Duke tenderly into his bed once he developed arthritis in his later years. So, I mean, they really did have just like this very special, a boy and his dog, like, you know, exactly what you think about in the movies, that type of relationship. So, I mean, this dog was his world. Um, that was until one day Keith came home and Duke wasn't there to greet him at the door. Oh. Yeah. I feel like you can see where this is going and I don't want to tell you, but here we go. Okay. Deep breath, everyone. I'm here. Okay. So... Keith's father had shot the Labrador Retriever, claiming that he had gotten into poisoned meat for coyotes. So this was something, I guess, that they did on farms. A lot of times they would leave out poisoned meat to kind of kill off like vermin or other, you know, pests. Um, This was truly a breaking point for Keith. And clearly, honestly, it's clearly something he held a grudge about well into his adult life, which same Holding a grudge about this. <laughs> For real. Like, at least wait till the kid can get home and say goodbye. Like, Yeah. No, it was super fucked up. It almost makes me... I don't want to, like, be on the side of the shitty dad. But, like, I wonder if something else happened to him. If he just maybe, like... If he had the arthritis, maybe he just wanted to put him yeah, down. I don't but, know. Like, I mean, but that's not how you do it. No. You don't poison them. You don't... Which, it sounds like it wasn't um, a situation where the dog was poisoned. It sounds like the dad shot him, yeah. which would arguably probably have been the more humane thing to do between the two, but I Let think we all know. Goodbye. You know, animal lovers, we don't just take them out back and shoot them. You know, oh. there's a... There's this, uh, you know, a painless and more humane way to do you it. You gotta give them a cheeseburger. You gotta oh, give them yeah. ice cream. Spoil their butts. I mean, can you tell at all that mm. we really love dogs we around do. here? Like, I mean, we're, we're dog people. Animals, just yeah. in general. Oh, yeah. 
So it was actually not long after this that Keith moved out and he lived on his own in comparative peace for a while, which seems like, okay, so then (laughs) where else do we have to go from here? Hmm. He was still in high school, but had saved money for a motorcycle. So he's living on his own, even though he's still in high school. He saved money for a motorcycle. Keith's father borrowed the motorcycle. He basically cajoled Keith into letting him borrow it. And he injured himself in a very serious alcohol-related accident. And, of course, you know, the bike's destroyed. So... Following the accident, Keith ended up taking on responsibility for the family business and selling his, you know, damaged motorcycle at his father's request. (laughs) Because apparently Keith is literally not allowed to have nice things or normal life. And again, we are not excusing his later actions again, of course, but just saying. Jeez. (sighs) Come on, man. So at 19 years old, Keith was very uncertain about his future. He met a 17-year-old named Rose. Both his father and Rose pressured Keith into marriage. After roughly a year of dating, they were married. Wow. Yeah. It was a rocky union from the start. Well, I mean, she forced him to marry her. Yeah, I mean, it was basically (laughs) like a combination of his family and her pressuring. You know, I think historically we'll find that doesn't end well. well. Yeah. Yeah. So Keith resorted to the torture and brutal killing of animals once again. No. Yeah. So this is a really interesting aspect of um, kind of Keith's story. Um, Keith had been hopeful that he and Rose were infertile as he actually didn't want children. No shit. Yeah. Weird. He was afraid they might turn out like him. Oh, well, that is so sad. It is sad. But (sighs) his daughter, Melissa, was born in 1979, followed by his son, Jason, in 1980. Um, The family moved to Canada he obviously he came from Canada. They moved backed up, backed up, backed up. <laughs> they moved back up there in 1981. Um, for a time at least, his social life seemed to improve, but this actually led to problems in his marriage with Rose when his partying got to be too much. Oh, Rose was unhappy in Canada. She missed her family and she didn't care for the cold, which. <laughs> Yeah, Canada, she be real cold. That's what I hear. <laughs> I've only been there in the warmer weather Yeah, months, same. So. Um, her frustration escalated when Keith was fired from his job around the time their third child was born. Dang. Yeah. Carrie was born in 1983. Um, along with losing his job, Keith's mother was diagnosed with cancer. Hmm. So the family moved back to Washington. Um, seemingly this increased his violent fantasies, depressed mood, and sexual frustration. Mm. These are pretty major elements of really his whole life story as it happens. Yeah, Keith started an affair. This takes us to his divorce in 1988. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit here. Um, Keith began dating a single mother named Cindy, who, as it turns out, was actually abusive to her children. Oh, okay. So they have shit in common. He's kind of, you know, he, some daddy issues. They say you end up, yeah. you know, dating your father. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> did, um, uh, did it, was there, God, I can't speak. Was there anything that said that he abused his children? Or no, was it just towards, like, the animals? Okay. No, I mean, it was, yeah, it was never, that's the interesting thing about, about his particular profile, his makeup, whatever you want to call it, is that he's never documented as having been violent to his children. And I think that really stems from what he went through as a child. So um, basically, though, you know, seeing Cindy and the abusive relationship that she had with her children, um, you know, it made him miss his kids and actually even Rose. Yeah. So one night when he actually worked up the guts to break up with Cindy, they fought and he took off. Well, when he returned, he found Cindy passed out drunk. What happens next is a move that is so fucking creepy and disgusting. I almost don't have the words to describe it. Okay. 
if I could have found any way that I could talk about Cindy without including this in the story, I definitely would have. This is really upsetting. Okay, so Keith comes back. He finds her passed out. He removed her clothing and proceeded to rape her four times while she was passed out. (sighs) Now, not once, not twice, not thrice, ladies and gentlemen, four fucking times. Like, he finally stopped because he began to get sore. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, to which I say, sir, I wish your dick had just fallen off. Right? Yeah. So it just doesn't get better. (laughs) Keith admitted this to Cindy when she confronted him about it, and she took him back. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not to victim shame or anything. No, we're not going to victim blame, but it's I know it's a hard, I don't know. I can't even. I can't. I don't have personal experience, so. Yeah, I can't go there. I can't. I can't go there. That's, um... So many alarm bells. Um, But she was hitting the snooze, apparently, all goddamn day. Um, So he would yo-yo back and forth between the two women. So this is Cindy and, um, you know, his uh, wife, Rose. That continued for a time, but the relationship with Cindy eventually dissolved. Weird. Yeah, I know. I wonder why. (laughs) Um, Turns out that he somehow was pissed at both of the women Because serial killer logic and misogyny. (gasps) And here's where we finally turn to a true crime page. Okay. So so he's already killed, really in horrific ways, a bunch of small animals. He's raped a woman. Now is when. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) This is like, I can't even fathom, like. It just it just shows you that escalation that oh yeah. it seems like it so naturally occurs with people with you know these very violent tendencies. So yeah. um we're gonna talk about the victims because I would really like to honor them and share their stories. Um, I want to preface this section by saying that for some of the victims, I was able to find more information than others. Um, but I've tried to share what I can to basically honor their memories and the story of, you know, what happened to them. Um, Also important to note that while in some cases you might find an independent detailed research, um, additional details about their death, I'm just, I'm only going to take it so far. Okay. Um, And only with some of the cases am I really going to get into, you know, kind of some of the specifics. Um, This is a really tough one because I feel like there are some things that make specific victims what happened to them more horrifying than just beyond your typical murder case. And I just, you know, I I feel like I can't say it enough. Yeah. (laughs) So I am not looking to glorify the gore in any case, but I do think that it is very telling about his state of mind in some instances. And uh, I thought a lot about this specifically for this case, but on a personal note, I feel kind of an internalized responsibility, not just to honor the victims, but to also shine a light on the tragic circumstances of their deaths. I feel a responsibility to that as well. I feel like it's the ugly truth about what happened to them. And I don't, maybe I'm crazy, but absorbing kind of some of the enormity of their horrific experiences feels like something that I do out of a sense of, you know, um, responsibility to them and, and not just honoring that they were murdered, but really, you know, feeling for them and trying to build that empathy. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to anyone else. Uh, probably I'm taking on more than is normal. Uh, (laughs) I feel like anyone who like has a passion for true crime. I mean, yeah. I think they they might get where you're coming from, you know. Yeah. They I'm included. Yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> they the infamous they. <laughs> so, <creeps>. yeah. <laughs> All of you creepy people. So, I just wanted to put that out there. Um I do feel like witnessing it in entirety is part of what I feel like is important when you're looking to try to honor the victims 
um, experience. So Keith's first victim was a 23 year old developmentally disabled woman who approached him in a bar briefly before returning to her friends playing pool. Um, little did she know that he would return with nefarious intentions. Mm. She had a sweet and naive, if sometimes mischievous nature. Her name was Tanya Bennett. Mm. She had left her home in Portland, Oregon, telling her mother that she was off to meet a boyfriend. Tanya was known to frequent bars in Northeast Portland, such as the Woodshed, the Copper Penny, and Thatcher's. And there's probably a lot of people living in Portland that are going, I've been to the Copper oh, Penny. I've heard of that. I've yeah. Never been to, <laughs> to which it. I say, I'm too young. <laughs> Is it closed now? I don't think it exists anymore. Okay. Yeah. Most of the, I did take a look at these bars. I actually, I, I, uh, I talked to both of my parents who were oh, frequenting okay. the bar scene back Ooh. in this day. They were young. Yeah. Um, and it sounded like, uh, yeah, they were familiar with them, but. They didn't have any particular, like, personal connection to to any particular of these bars or to the case or anything, so. I remember growing up, like, lis- like hearing the Copper Penny the Copper on the Penny. radio. Yeah. Like, We're having this event at the Copper at the Penny. Copper Penny. And I was like, ooh. I would love to go to that. Yeah. I'm like, I can't. Five. <laughs> so drinking and playing pool in bars was how Tanya passed most of her evenings. She was a petite and pretty young woman at 5'5", five five, with dark brown hair and eyes. It was known to people that loved her that it was not unusual to greet strangers with an unexpected hug, as oh. she did the night she met Keith. Oh my goodness. Yeah, like very one of sweet those people girl. that is just like, I love everyone. Yeah, just a very sweet soul. <sighs> Um, Keith was taken aback by the kind, if, you know, maybe a little bit forward gesture. He watched her from across the bar, actually questioning one of the waitresses about her. Um, He went home, but eventually returned to the bar and convinced her to go out to eat with him. He persuaded her to accompany him to his house. There he assaulted, beat, and strangled her. Um, This is one case in particular where uh, I've got a lot of details about like minute to minute of her um assault and i'm just not gonna go there okay it's just too hard it's just too hard for me um just to think about i feel like it just really it really it it hurts me more that this is someone that he specifically approached that was developmentally disabled and he was very well aware of that yeah um that just it i and maybe was, maybe that maybe that's wrong to say, but I feel like it hits me different. Yeah, it, it does. just does. And someone who is so like obviously vibrant such and such a sweet, vibrant girl. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> um. So Tanya Bennett was killed on January twenty first, nineteen ninety, and her body was discovered by a biker near the Vista House in Corbett, Oregon, mm. which I have been to. Oh. You will see that is a repeating theme. <laughs> Great. She would remain unidentified for just over a week until her mother saw a police sketch and followed up with a visit to the morgue to identify her. Oh. Strangely, a couple was implicated in Tanya's death after the girlfriend falsely confessed. What? So, yeah, this is a little bit of an aside Weird. here. Um Laverne Arlise Pavlinak not only falsely confessed to assisting in the 1990 murder of 23-year-old Tanya Bennett of Portland, Oregon, she also implicated her boyfriend, John Sosnovsky, in Tanya Bennett's murder. Apparently, the couple receiving media attention and getting credit for the murder simultaneously enraged but also kind of relieved Keith. In January, while Laverne was on trial, a message had been found on a men's room wall at the Greyhound bus depot in Livingston, Montana. It read, I killed Tanya Bennett January 21st, 1990 in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her, and loved it. I'm sick, but I enjoy myself too. Two people took the blame, and I'm free. Jesus. A few days later, in a men's room at a truck stop in Umatilla, Oregon, a second message was discovered. 
I killed Tanya Bennett in Portland. Two people got the blame so I can kill again. Both messages were signed with a happy face. Ooh. Just a circle with two dots for eyes and a broad crescent smile. A happy face has literally never been creepier. Like, seriously. Yeah. Ew. Detectives. What o- sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what an <laughs> ominous message and then a freaking happy face. Yeah. It's horrific. <sighs> Um, detectives in Portland theorize that some unknown friend of John's wrote the graffiti in an effort to spring John from prison, but the author was untraceable. Both Laverne and John were convicted, with Laverne receiving a 10-year sentence. They served four years before both were exonerated after serial killer Keith Jesperson confessed to Bennett's murder. So, hopefully... Laverne put some distance between herself and John because, you know, he was pissed. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's been rumored that she implicated John in the murder in the first place to escape their abusive relationship. I I wonder why she thought that she needed to say that she was involved. Well, I'm going to get to it. Okay. okay. (laughs) So, I mean, it's, it's fucking awful in so many ways because, honestly, I find this story somewhat credible because there's actually a decent amount of evidence that there actually was domestic abuse in their relationship. So we're not going to deep dive on that. So just keep in mind, this doesn't seem to have been fully substantiated that that was fully the reason why she accused John. Um, John's previous wives were adamant that he had never been abusive in their relationships. And they said this just simply didn't make sense to them. But I do think it's very possible, though, that Laverne was telling the truth and it honestly it would shed some light on the choices she made. So, I mean, bear in mind, she only implicated herself when it became very clear that the cops would probably be setting both of them free. So, oh. here just kind of lay out, you know, the big picture. In a situation that was potentially already violent, you know, he's going to be pissed after be putting after being put through the ringer with the cops. Yeah. So, I mean, fear of an abuser can make people do things that an outside observer would think are crazy just to try Mm -hmm. to get away from that situation, including making false statements about your own involvement in a crime that neither you or your partner had anything to do with. Oh, man. So her story started that John did it. She knew that he did it. But then when they were both potentially going to be released, she started by kind of tiptoeing and implicating herself in less incriminating ways. Man. And they ended up both being convicted. Because jail is better than abuse. Like, oh my God. I mean, she probably was afraid that if they both got loose after that, that he would kill her. I mean, I would be. For real. And like, and just because he didn't abuse his past you know relationships we all know like you can single out one person right it can happen yeah absolutely yeah i mean intimate partner violence is i think we want to make sense of it but it doesn't make sense yeah it's not okay (laughs) ever and you know there's not always gonna be an instance where somebody has to be the start of that pattern yeah so exactly Yeah. So, I mean, just again, you know, just trying to give you the full picture and kind of flesh out where, you know, maybe some of these things haven't been fully substantiated. But if you, you know, kind of follow the breadcrumb trail, you can start to put some things together. So, yeah. um, Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit. In the summer of 1992, Jesperson met a woman when he was at a break check spot on I-15 just outside of San Bernardino, California. He described her as pretty and smelling good. Oh, <laughs> this poor woman had traveled as far as she could with another truck driver, but she parted ways with him as he unloaded at an Albertsons. So she was, according to Keith, trying to get to Phoenix and her name was Claudia. She hopped in with Keith. Um, he noted that she didn't have any luggage. They pulled off the road at the Burns Brother truck stop in Coachella Ooh. So this guy literally has traveled to so many places that I've been or want to go. Oh and he's God. done horrible fucking things there. It's literally going to haunt me 
all over the Pacific yeah. Northwest. And it doesn't stop there. There's places outside of our region that I'm just like, ruined, forever Ugh. tainted. Ruining it for all of us as well. <sighs> Keith, you're the worst. <laughs> okay. So Keith describes settling into the sleeper portion of his truck. He stated that he kissed Claudia. She initially resisted, saying that if he wanted sex, he just had to ask and she would tell him how much. Oh, okay. This was a very common thing for a lot of the women that kind of hitched rides yeah. with truck drivers at the time. Um, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of like background and kind of information on that. I know a lot more about what goes on with truck drivers and at truck stops than I thought I ever would have Man. reason to. So... Um, the details of the encounter he described leave no doubt in my mind that even their first contact should definitely be considered rape. He says after this, she pretended to enjoy herself in an attempt to befriend him so that he wouldn't harm her. Because, Aww. duh, Keith, that's what women do to men like you. Yeah. <laughs> They stopped at another truck stop to eat and shower, and he wondered why she didn't just run off then. When they both got back in the truck, Keith claims he learned her true desires when she asked him for crank. Oh. So this is a very common thing where there's a, oftentimes a lot of drugs that are kind of floating around in this world. And, um, you know, I don't want to make too many broad generalizations, but we'll get back into the <laughs> into the story. Um, he said she even got on his CB radio trying to locate someone that would provide her with drugs. Dang. Yeah. So she was pretty desperate. And yeah. She's, do... I mean, that's pretty brazen. Yeah. Um, he scolded her for using the radio and warned that he didn't allow drugs in his truck. Um, during this conversation, she asked him for money for the sex they had previously had, which enraged Keith. Mm. She threatened to report him for the assault, saying, what's it going to be, your money or jail? Mm. Keith locked the doors and said, neither one, bitch. Oh, no. It's just like something out of a horror film. Yeah. Um, he proceeded to duct tape her arms and legs. He rendered her unconscious. Uh, I mean, at least or so he thought until she said, this is bullshit. You can't kill me. Because obviously she's seeing the writing on the wall. Yeah, she knows. Yeah. Um, while Keith raped her in the sleeper portion of the truck again, two police cars pulled up and briefly allowed their canine unit to seek some cool in the shade of his truck while they went inside a nearby restaurant to eat. Oh, my God. Meanwhile, she had been struggling to escape from her restraints, but Keith took off after being spooked by the cops before she could make a run for it. Oh. He described raping her yet again at the next truck stop until he could no longer maintain an erection. Oh. Yeah. It's just, it's just gross. Um, this victim is when he started playing what he called the death game. I don't like that. Yeah, it's not. It's it not. It's not my grave. It's my least fave. Um, Let's never play that. No, we're never playing this game. Much like the Ouija board, <laughs> well, we're never playing this game. <laughs> I've got enough going on in this space. Um, he would repeatedly strangle the victim to the point of unconsciousness, allow her to come to, and start all over again. So, I mean, this is commonly known as, um, if you're doing it to yourself, autoerotic asphyxiation. Um, that's not what this was, that obviously. So every time Claudia came to, she continued berating Keith for what he was doing because, um, yeah, Keith, it was super fucked up and she was probably absolutely terrified. Yeah. Um, he then started doing a countdown where he told her to count and take a deep breath before he continued strangling her, mm. starting with 10 and progressing lower. After he finally strangled her to death, he went into the truck stop restaurant and ordered an iced tea while he mulled over how to dispose of her body. Oh. He encountered another police officer on his way to Arizona before he had a chance to remove her body from his truck. But he was able to play it cool until the officer continued along. Holy shit. Like, how many chances? Seriously. Seriously. Law enforcement. I get it was the 90s, but 
Can we go with the program here? They didn't know. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) how many times have they probably happened upon somebody that was up to no good? And I mean, there's sometimes there's only so much you can do. Um, Her body, which had been strangled multiple times and tied up with duct tape, was found near Blythe, California on August 30th, 1992. Her identity remains unknown. Really? Yeah. Most of his victims have been identified at this point, but um, everything that I was able to find in my research shows that she's still unidentified. I mean, if she was like a trans... Transient is that yeah the word? transient yeah <laughs> um I, yeah I mean people that are you know kind of living on the on the edge um you know whether that's you know dealing with addiction they're dealing with um you know houselessness they're dealing with any number of other issues mental illness whatever they just tend to be very vulnerable and sometimes you know the people that should have been their safety net have long since lost track of them. And I think probably, yeah. you know, more than likely that's what we're looking at in this case. And so. who knows where she even like came from and her family yeah. just was like, exactly. She left. Yeah. I mean, if she was, if she had traveled Ow. already with somebody else, maybe she had just already come from the other side of the country. Yeah. Who knows? Oh, so. Are you done hurting yourself? I sorry everyone for that loud. Uh, <laughs> Cassie is really upset about this case, and she it was like she just whacked her whacked elbow, my elbow in disgust in the middle of your sentence. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, we're not retaking that yeah. one. No, we're not. We're absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah. So about a month later, Keith killed another woman in Turlock, California. This woman entered his truck at a truck stop while he was sleeping. Ooh. She got in his truck when he was sleeping? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, you're you're not going to love this. Okay. Um, This victim has been identified as Cynthia Lynn Rose Wilcox. However, Keith later said he actually killed another woman and did not recognize Wilcox's photo. I really hate it when these assholes can't even keep their story straight. Their victims had so little value to them, they can't even bother be bothered to remember yeah. like which one was that again yeah um, i exact that's exactly ooh. what's happening here and i really hate it mm. um so in november 1992 keith had an encounter with a sex worker named Lori ann pentland at a truck stop as he returned from california to oregon he met Lori at the burns brothers truck stop in wilsonville Oh, Wilson. He's literally, again, just Mm -hmm. tainting the whole fucking Pacific Mm Northwest. Okay, I'm moving on. I'm I'm just, I'm really fucking pissed about that. (laughs) Lori was a favorite amongst the truckers, including Keith. He had never been bothered by her apparently constantly rising prices. Um, That was until this encounter where she tried to upcharge him after the deed had been done, according to him. Yeah. So a struggle ensued over 40 fucking dollars. Really? Ugh. That's what her life was worth to you. 40 bucks. He strangled her and left her body in Salem, Oregon after retrieving her cash. Mm. Um, In Corning, California, Keith found his next victim, a woman he said was named Cindy and he described as half-starved, homeless, with red hair and a maternal appearance. He told a waitress to get her whatever she wanted and put it on his tab without telling her. Um, It was clearly a small act of kindness that endeared him to her. He invited her to accompany him and she readily agreed if he would take her to where her sister lived in Sacramento. Her remains were found in Merced County, California, on June 3rd, 1993. Her real name remains a mystery based on my research, which is truly awful. So I really, really hate that after this many years and knowing exactly where they were taken from in most cases and where the bodies were found, that we we don't know who these women were. Yeah. It just gets me in the feels in not a good way. Um, In September 1994, the body of a woman was found in Florida. Her actual identity is unknown, but Susanna, which Keith stated may have been her name. (gasps) 
<sighs> may have really was confirmed to be one of his victims because he knew about the tie wraps around her throat. Oh. Soon after, Angela Sabriz ran into Keith at a bar in Spokane, Washington in January of 1995. She traveled east with him in his truck. He has said he strangled her because she wouldn't let him sleep. <laughs> after the what? murder... <gasps> Keith remembered they'd spent days together and he'd let her use a credit card of his. In an effort to avoid detection of his crime, he decided to drag her body underneath his truck to impede identification. Wait a minute. Yeah. Her body was oh. concealed slightly underneath his rig, but he avoided other truckers and vehicles as much as he could, proceeding to drag her body oh. approximately 12 miles. Oh, my God. That is so fucked. Yeah. I mean, he he did everything that he could to literally make anything that was left of her remains completely unidentifiable by sight. Oh. And that's he hasn't done that before, right? No, that was no. the first. This is a this is a first and only. Oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil that for you and let you know that that's not gonna happen again. That seems really risky too. Like it is. It absolutely was risky. Um, like I said, he was definitely oh. trying to avoid other um, trucks and other vehicles on the road. But um, he admitted that yeah, I mean, he tied her up underneath the vehicle in such a way that it would you know literally drag her body on the asphalt but she wasn't fully concealed so Jeez. it was a risky move i mean yeah so this is where we get to kind of some of the stuff that just makes you mad to think about the fact that he did some of these things to really obviously avoid detection oh, so no he left her remains in Nebraska, though it is supposed that she was likely killed in Wyoming. He falsified his driving logs and avoided truck check-in spots by passing them before they were open in the morning so there would be no record of him in the area. Oh, yeah. interesting. Clever so, little snake. He knew how to work the system here. Sure did. Um, Keith's last confirmed victim was Julie Winningham, who had actually been his girlfriend. Aww. They had a chance meeting at the Troutdale Burns Brothers that very briefly reignited their old flame, hmm. as well as his frustration and hatred. They played pool with her local friends, and Keith said she got drunk that night. She proposed to him, and shortly after, they even visited her mother to announce their engagement. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. He said that at the time, he and Julie were falling back in love. Keith soon learned she needed financial support to face her current legal trouble related to a DUI. Mm. Julie was apparently up to her same tricks, according to Keith, taking advantage of men's feelings for money. Hmm. Which, first of all, just like, seriously, cry me a river, right. Keith, because you fucking killed her, dude. I know. She may have had ulterior motives for reconnecting with him, but Jesus, like, just break up with her. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he claimed that she even went so far as to threaten him with extortion, and that's why he ended up killing her. Oh, okay. Because there's always a perfectly good reason, right? I gotta find that reason. Yeah. So here's a bit of backstory on his relationship with Julie prior to the murder. They had traveled together for a time, but he reported being unimpressed by their first sexual encounter after he spent so much money on her when they visited Knott's Berry Farm. What? <laughs> yeah. <gasps> I gave you all this money and took you out, and you didn't impress me sexually. Yeah. It's a real... The misogyny runs oh my deep. Oh, God. So one of the pictures taken that day, she gifted to her mother, and it would end up being widely circulated in the media. Oh. Um, he was also frustrated that she seemed put off by his lack of interest in doing drugs. He reportedly has strong feelings for her and did at one point even buy her a joint. His jaw dropped at the 
$40 price tag, but he was satisfied with the sex afterwards. Oh, okay. So mm-hmm. that makes it all better. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, the misogyny is overwhelming with this guy. Oy. Yeah. Julie was well-liked by his friends, and she even moved in with his friend Billy and his friend, or his girlfriend, I should say, Jenny. Keith and Julie dated for about a year, but he ended it when he found out that she was sleeping with his friend Bill. Oh. Yes, oh, and he no. was her roommate at the time. Eesh. Um, He swore to never see her again, but obviously we know now that it didn't work out like he planned. <laughs> so the apparent author of the Happy Face notes was identified in March 1995, shortly after the remains of 41-year-old Julie Anne Winningham were found at a scenic outlook near Washougal, Washington. Mm. Keith Jesperson has claimed that he took up to 166 lives. Oh my God. But only eight murders have been officially attributed to him. So those are the women that we've talked about today. Um, I think this is probably more than likely just a classic case of a serial killer wanting to over-exaggerate his own exploits. I hope so. Like, yeah. I really hope so. I really hope so. I think that because all of these were so close together and um, we've been able to really document those, um, I, I think that's pro- more than likely the case. But. Okay. Keith Jesperson was known as the happy face killer because he drew smiley faces on his many letters to both the media and prosecutors, including the haunting messages he left at truck stops about his first victim, Tanya Bennett. Yeah, if he's like writing in letters, writing letters and stuff to the media, like that's, yeah. it's pretty, um, what what's that word? It's pretty damning, I think. Y- yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gross. Well, what's interesting about him in particular, and I was actually talking to somebody about this next case recently, and they were kind of asking questions about him and sort of like what his motives were. What's interesting is a lot of the letters that he wrote after being convicted or after being jailed were actually an attempt to free John and Laverne. Who had been falsely convicted of... Um, the first murder of uh, Tanya Bennett. Hmm. So what's interesting to me about that is that there are two things that you can kind of speculate about what the motive was there. He said that it was obviously a miscarriage of justice, and he literally, I mean, to his credit, he definitely was um, a leading charge behind them eventually being released. Um, And you might argue that he didn't want people serving time for a crime that he actually commit, but I think that probably most people and a lot of the sources that I looked at argued that it was really just about that he was pissed off in the first place that they got credit for his murder. Yeah, obviously, he's writing on bathroom walls and shit. (laughs) <laughs> right. So, I mean, he did make a lot of public statements and he wrote letters and all of these things. And I I think it's certainly a positive thing that people that did not commit the crimes um, were eventually released. But the motives behind that, I think, are probably less than altruistic. Yeah. So he is currently imprisoned at the Oregon State Penitentiary. His beautiful daughter, Melissa Moore, has said that she had a happy childhood despite growing up with a clearly very violent and disturbed man for a father. She is a crime correspondent for wow. Crime Watch Daily. Wow, that's awesome. Yes. And she actually has more than one podcast um, where she openly talks about his father and his crimes, wow. um, along with her upbringing and a, a number of other topics. She has made TV appearances on shows like Oprah and Dr. Phil. Um, and of course, you know, there was a Lifetime movie made. Oh, I didn't know. Mm-hmm. She also wrote a book. Uh, called Shattered Silence, the untold story of a serial killer's daughter. Um, Some people might not be comfortable sharing in the ways that she does, but I do think it's very brave. Um, So now I think that like we've really kind of covered just about everything I could find on this topic, um, you know, touched on everything in some way or another. I want to go into the tarot reading because... um, We were talking about they are for once almost on the surface, 
country life, haven of refuge, a species of domestic harvest, home, repose, concord, harmony, prosperity, peace, and the perfected work of these. So I think this is kind of about, um, it, it, it says it in the beginning, they are for once almost on the surface. And so it's like on the surface, I think maybe certain people at times thought that, okay, well, you know, now Keith is, um, you know, his family's moved and it seems like he's doing better because he's doing better in school. But that's just surface, you know, socially, he's still not doing well. You know, he's still enduring a lot of abuse at home. He gets married. That's an unhappy marriage. He's, you know, not fulfilled by his partner sexually and in a number of other ways. Yeah. Um, if we go back to um, the small book here, I'm going to pull up the Four of Wands. This is just really haunting. It says, the garden is growing luxuriously, and these two have wandered away from their stress and planning to have a little fun. It might be a surprise, but you've got some good times on the horizon. Take a break from your hard work and put all of your energy into treating yourself. Mm. So one of the things that I didn't go into full depth in this case was that at certain points, um, you know, with girlfriends, um, like Julie, Keith had actually shared the driving responsibility. Um, they'd been a, a driving team. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what's interesting about that is, like, it seemed like on the surface, oh, this is great, you know, we'll be able to get further, you know, we're working as a team, this is great. But, you know, Julie wasn't a very good driver. She'd go past where they needed to go. And then, Aww. you know, he'd wake up and they're in the wrong city. Oh, all no. These things. So I feel like this just kind of like alludes to that. It's like just when you think things are like getting better or there's good times on the horizon, it's like, ugh. And then, yeah. you know, I just feel like treating himself. Ew. I, yeah, I, don't I just like feel that. I just feel like this is him just letting the worst part of himself out when all of the things that he's tried so hard to kind of like manifest are not Ugh. working out. Yeah. So I don't know. That's my interpretation of it. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm interested to hear if people think that the Four of Wands just maybe has nothing to do with this case. But <laughs> that's the one I pick. Um, I, like I was going definitely with your drawn gut. to it. Going yeah. with your gut about the card of like yeah. what you think about the meaning is kind of what tarot is, you know? Absolutely. All righty. And it's time to do some cleansing of our hearts, minds, and homes. Good. Um, mm -hmm. So like have a weird day? No. Don't have a weird day. Have a have a good day? No, that's no, no that's, that's too quite right. That's too generic. Okay. Mm. Hmm. Have, Have a, a creepy, creepy ass, ass day. day. Yeah, that does feel right. See you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Cunts. <laughs> <laughs> so, for all of you that are listening, if you have any true crime or paranormal stories that you want us to share, Maybe with the whole Pacific Northwest. Yes, we would love to read them on the pod. <laughs> yes, we will read them out loud. <laughs> Not just in our heads. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to be from the Pacific Northwest. If you would like to share, email us at pnwhauntsandhomicides at gmail.com. It's all spelled out, no special characters. Super duper easy peasy. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Same thing as the email at PNW Haunts and Homicides, all spelled out, no special characters. Please also rate and review us on whatever platform you're listening to and check out our stories on social media because our meme game is hot. <laughs> Agreed. And if you agree, like Caitlin, you can also find us on Patreon and support the show. Bitchin'. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
a lot of homework on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> I assign him stuff on him the soon. daily. I know, right? <laughs> He's just waiting for the day that the pod takes off and he can be a stay-at-home husband. We're going to start paying discussed. you so soon. Yeah. <laughs> At least $20 a month. Yeah. Wink, wink. <laughs> nudge, nudge. Doll hairs. Yeah, doll hairs. Absolutely. Haunted doll hairs. Haunted doll hairs. <laughs> 